So, welcome. I'm here to talk about simple graphics, and it's going to be called Pixel. So let me first explain why I'm standing here. How did I get started with computers? Well, I'm, I'm fairly old compared to most people nowadays. <laughs> At least I feel very old, because I started with this thing. Some of you may be old enough to recognize it. It's a Commodore 64, 64 kilobytes of RAM, so that's 0 0.000064 gigabytes. It's running at a, a blistering 0 0.0009 gigahertz. It's, it's somewhat, it's not comparable really. The thing is, I had that thing since I was five, and that was great because it had games. And games are awesome. If you're a kid, play games, they're good. And I tried playing games until I was around seven, and suddenly one of the games said, no, syntax error in line 1200 something. I'm looking at it like, what do you mean syntax error? I was playing a game. But I've seen this line number, so list 12 something. That looks like code. That looks like something that's in my dad's books. What happens if I type list, enter? This is what makes a game. I need to learn this. So I did. Went on to write some, some tiny things on the C64 because you're seven years old, how much can you do? Mostly just loading a game and then trying to modify something, changing the color. And then at some point our Commodore broke, so we got a PC. And a PC came with this game, which is Nibbles. It's a small snake game, you point it at some things and it eats them. And then the tail grows and everything. I remember, this is basic. I know basic. I can do this. So I went in the code and changed the colors from red to green. And it worked. Then I changed the boundaries, so the boundaries are gone, so you can go outside of bounds. Well, it sort of worked until it crashed. <laughs> and then I figured out, well, what if I make it wrap? So if you go out on the right, you go back on the left. And that worked, so I had the complete modification. I could do anything I wanted, which is awesome. But I kept playing around in basic until at some point I got into more advanced games. So this is about the year 95, and I got to this game, Crusader No Remorse, which is a really nice game, but it ran at a time when computers were a little bit faster. So my computer at that time was running at a, a, a mind-boggling 0.2 gigahertz, which meant it had to be cooled. And the cooling systems were as primitive as they were at the moment you just needed cooling, which meant that they basically had a clip-on mechanism, which was four hooks hooking around your CPU, because the motherboard has no adaptation, there's no place to hook it otherwise, you just have to sort of keep your fingers crossed that it's gonna stay on. And I found out during playing this game that mine didn't. I found out because it crashed with an assert saying, assertion failed in this line in that file .cpp. So I tried that, took five minutes to crash, rebooted, four minutes, rebooted, three minutes. Okay, go outside to play, come back an hour later, try it again, it's five minutes. Open up the case and it was just sitting there at the bottom spinning while the CPU was overheating. Okay, it's Saturday afternoon, I'm 12, all the shops are closed, all the shops will be closed today. How could I get through the weekend without playing a game, come on, it's, it's crazy. So I put it back on with a glue stick, <laughs> and that works for the computers in 95. <laughs> so that's the cooler it was, and one of these pins had broken off. So that got me started in games. So that got me thinking, what needs to change to make C++ a good first programming language? I mean, I had it as basically a second language, how can we make this a good first language for people? And I asked a question on Twitter and the replies were, as you can expect. Nothing, it's ridiculous. If you want a good internal language, learn C. If you want simple C++, learn Java. <laughs> okay, so C, Java, Rust has a lot of similarities. Of course, somebody has to say Rust. <laughs> um, but one thing in this stands out, very good compiler error messages versus template barf. That's a really good point. Although error messages have improved a whole lot in the past 10 years, there's still something to be gained there. Okay, somebody taught Turing, which is a good language for teaching, but everybody seemed like they hated it. Um, and then John Reger replied, he's a compiler, uh, a compiler professor at the University of Utah. And he says the first language needs to be not huge and not unsafe. 
Okay, I get that. If it's huge, he can't learn it. If it's unsafe, it will crash all the time. But then I started thinking, if it needs to be not huge, just stop using all the old bits and all the stuff you don't need to know and just make a good teaching guide that says this is how you learn C++. And then he replied to that, well, saying, well, safe doesn't make it a good language, but unsafe makes it a bad one. But is, C is modern C++ really unsafe? If you don't have a new, you can't forget a delete. If you don't have any arrays, you can't go out of bounds. I'm not sure it's that unsafe. So in summary, they basically said use Turing, Rust, C, Java, anything but C++. Until EWG chair replied and said, we need to stop fantasizing about unicorns. Okay, so when the, the person leading the committee basically says, nope, it's like, this is not gonna happen until hell freezes over. Now Jason might know this. <laughs> because do you know where hell is? It's in Michigan. So this is hell. <laughs> and in case you think this is just from one random day, this is the weather report. That is hell, and it's currently about minus 35 Celsius. Yeah, definitely. So hell is frozen over. OK, that's one thing out of the way. Let's continue. These are things that run C++ code. I, you may have heard of these before. They were presented at CppCon. And these are basically jewelry meant for small kids to learn to program C++. So much so that a nine-year-old is on stage teaching people to code C++. But, you know, maybe it's just girls. Maybe girls are just inherently really good at programming we just haven't noticed. Could be. But then we have these things. And boys like these for, because they're not jewelry. For some reason, that's not a good compatibility thing. And these are also programmed by small kids in C++. So maybe it's not the language? Patrice Roy, a professor from Canada, if I recall, uh, says language isn't the problem. I've used C++ for novices in the past 20 years, and it's fine. They have similar difficulties, and language is not the issue. Well, we need to get rid of the, the heritage of C, so get rid of the old stuff. And stop teaching C and start teaching SCL. So I could go on a whole while about this, but I'm not going to because somebody else did it way better than I ever could, which is Kate Gregory. So she did a talk, Stop Teaching C, at CPPCon 2015. Let us stop trying to use C and use the C++ parts of C++ to make good code. Okay. Now what else do we need? Tools. We need to have a lot of things that understand C++ that can tell us about it, that can transform it, that can code form it, that can highlight it. And we need libraries, which come in packages, so that we can say, I would like to use this library, and poof, magic happens, it works. Instead of, let's download this zip file, copy it to some directory, try to use it, oh no, it's compiled with the wrong compiler options for my compiler, let's use a new, comp yeah. So, we need tools for novices and experts, because everybody faces this problem. So we need a good build tool, something that works, and something that's easy to use. And those seem to be anathema to each other. We need package management, because when you want to build something, you don't want to start from zero every time. You want to use whatever everybody else has made already. And we need some good IDE that will tie everything together and give you the ability to start writing code, press a button, magic happens, it comes out. What else do we need? Well, this one is, is one that many people mentioned. A beginner, if he's not academic, needs to be impressed with quick and visual results. And even on the business side, we don't even have a capable date time class. So I'm gonna focus on the first part, quick and visible results. Second reply, the number one thing I'd request is some sort of environment so you can do things straight away. Open a window, draw stuff. I'm seeing a pattern. Offer a way to show something visually to the user. Text, shapes, don't have a console output. And even on Discord, I remember my Casio programmable sitting in math class programming rotating cubes, which is fun because you get to see things. They're moving, they're animating, as opposed to there's an answer. So we need something that shows beginners quick results. 
Which brings me to why I'm giving a talk. I basically took that as a list of things to have, and I figured out well, which things do we need to make. We need to have some build system that works and that doesn't have a ton of configuration. So unless you're doing something weird, you have no configuration. If you are doing something weird within reason, you can configure it. If you're doing something totally crazy, it's just gonna say no. If you wanna keep using it, make your code better. We need simple graphics. We need to have something that you can start up, you can set up, and you can have running without a whole lot of trouble. As in, if I gave this to a 10-year-old, they should be able to have it running in 10 minutes and have something on screen that's showing things they like to show. And I need some kind of functional and usable package manager so I can give this entire thing to somebody on a computer and tell them just type this command to build things, all the packages you need will automatically appear and it will run automatically. So you don't have any of the big problems. So you get from zero to a working game in a minute. So the first thing was evoke. Um, build systems are hard and there's a whole lot of time that you're spending in building your software when actually what you're telling it is, I wrote these three files, there's these three files, they have these names which you could get from a directory listing and you need to build these as if they're source code. Well, I know they're source code, they, they have the CPP. And then there's this second folder which has this name which you should compile to an executable with that name and then link to the other headers because I'm including them. Why do I keep telling everything to the build system when I've already told it to my computer somewhere? Can't I just read that and use it? So that's evoke. But we're not gonna talk about that because I did at CVPCon 2018. There's a link to the, vi to the video of that, so let's not do it right now. And then there is the second one that we're going about, which is Pixel. And Pixel is something that's sort of up my alley. I have some prior experience with OpenGL. I know about graphics. There's a 2D graphics proposal from BSI, made by Guy. And there is a whole lot of stuff in there, which on one hand you need, and on the other hand is prohibitive. Because you have a whole lot of uh, classes to deal with points, vectors, logical operations, a whole lot of linear algebra that's not actually part of graphics. And then there's the actual graphics stuff as well. And it's limited to graphics, so you can't go beyond. So it's almost everything you need to make a game, except not quite entirely. So I'm going slightly differently with that. Well, how hard could it be to make this? So this guy pointed to me and said, well, if you say it can't be that hard, go make one. Start tonight, you have two hours. Well, up to a point, that works. <laughs> and then I've continued for another long time to keep developing it. So then why Accio? The third one. Why not just use one that exists? There are package managers, there's Conan, there's VC package. Well, there needs to be one that's good and universal. Maybe Conan, maybe VC package, but that disqualifies a bunch already. But I need file lookup, uh, package lookup by name. The build system sees include statements and it sees I have nothing to fill this include statement. So dear package manager, magically make this work. And then most package managers say, well, what's the name of the package? I don't know, the header's called catch. So I'm guessing it's some kind of catch, but there's nobody translating between the two. So I need this to have it work. So I'm hoping that somebody is doing that, and I'm really hoping somebody will add the file mapping. If not, then maybe I'll be on stage in early 2020 giving a talk about a package manager. I am hoping I don't do that. So we have a set of three. We can do simple things. We can get simple programs working. It does only work if you're doing sane things. Um, but it's only uh, allowing you to do more complicated things if it doesn't complicate the simple things. So why not just use CMake, Make, and Mason? Oh, have you tried using CMake? Who here has tried using CMake? Okay, who here likes working with CMake? That's three, that's three and a half hands, I guess. That's impressive. That's Stockholm Syndrome. Yeah. <laughs> Guy remarks this might be Stockholm Syndrome. Who here has used make, as in not with CMake, just writing your own handwritten make files? Who here likes writing handwritten make files? That's also three. So in terms of general improvement over make, CMake is not necessarily much better. <laughs> Who here has tried Mason? That's one. <laughs> Mason is one of the more modern build systems, and it's, as far as I can tell, a whole lot better to use. Do you like using it? It is better than CMake. Is it better than Make? Sorry? Is it better than Make? Anything. <laughs> That's a strong statement. 
So why not just use one of these? Well, have you tried using any of these build systems without writing any configuration or input? Anyone? Nope. So that means that when I finish writing my program, I need to write something to build my software, which is more work, more things to learn, more things to understand. So for an absolute beginner, I don't want this. So we make something else. So why not just use SDL and SFML and GLFW and any other three or four letter acronym? These are good. These are really good. And the one problem they have for a beginner is not that they're not good enough, not that they don't have the right level of abstraction, but that they are big. They are really big. SFML, for example, has a base layer where you can use 2D graphics as implemented by them. You can use 3D graphics, you can use Vulkan, you can use OpenGL, you can probably use Metal in any of the versions from the past 10 years. Starting with that is gonna be terrifying. If you're trying to find out the simple subset of absolute minimal things you were trying to use, this is not a great start. And there's one more thing. These libraries have both a big surface, but they also are relatively opaque to the user to find out how they work because they do do all the work that they claim they do. What you sort of want is something that is a simple library that has like five classes maximum, which just says this is the stuff that we can use. For anything more, go figure out how to use one of these underlying libraries. If you want to use different colors or different textures, 3D graphics, shaders, graphical things, don't use this library, just go through the library, learn what's in it, absorb it into your program, and then continue. So Pixel is based on SDL. So if you're using it, you can continue to use all of SDL, and you can replace all the classes it offers you with something you write yourself, which as you're continuing is probably what you should be doing. And by that, learning how it works. And for the package management, all of these don't give you a mapping from file to package, except for apt, which does. There's a tool you can install called app file, which does exactly the thing that I need which just shows the other problem with apt. Who here has apt on his computer? Yes, apt get, Ubuntu, Debian. Yes, it's basically Ubuntu and Debian. It is not on Windows, it is not on Macs. So generally usable, no. The right function, yes. The second problem with apt is that it's a, an operating system package manager, which means it will need root rights to install something. <coughs> If you somehow wrangle it to be able to install something locally, it could be more usable, but even then, getting something into apt is a whole lot more work than getting something into Conan or VC package. You yes? Can Nix also. Hmm? You can try Nix also. It doesn't work on Windows, but it works everywhere else. And it has the uh, reverse lookup. So. Yeah, oh, that's a good one. So there's a suggestion from Juanpe about using Nix. I haven't looked too deeply into that. Maybe that's the answer. I'm hoping so. So let's talk about this. Does anybody recognize what this is? These are spherical cows in a vacuum. Does anybody know the joke? <laughs> okay, so there's a farmer who's going to a bunch of physicists asking for help in figuring out how to get more milk out of his cows. So they go back to the, to the university, apply some models, de decide on some things, and they come, come back to him like, we can provide 300% more milk from your cows but we've only proven it for spherical cows in a vacuum. <laughs> but there's a fundamental thing to learn from that. We simplify things so they are easier to grasp and we can actually accomplish things, then to translate back into the real world, to go to the complicated things and actually make them work. So if physicists can abstract to spherical cows, maybe we should make things more simple. So what is simple? I've tried looking it up in the dictionary, and it's huge. It's one of the most complicated words in the dictionary, ironically. <laughs> so it's lacking in knowledge or expertise, so a simple amateur of the arts. It is free of secondary complications. It's simple, there's a simple vitamin D deficiency. It is only one main clause and no subordinate clauses. It has no modifiers, it has no complements, it has no objects. It's a basic element, it's a fundamental thing. It's not made up of many, uh, many individual parts. It is free from elaboration and figuration. It is not subdivided into branches or leaves. 
it is easily understood and performed. But this one's probably the most applicable one. And as you can see by the numbering, I've left off all the other definitions of simple, just to make it, well, simple. <laughs> so maybe this is just the wrong word to look up. Maybe what we're looking for is not something that's simple, but something that's intuitive. So let's go to intuitive. It's known or perceived by intuition. <laughs> Directly apprehended. Okay, so intuitive depends on intuition. Maybe it's a different definition. It's knowable by intuition. <laughs> it's based on or agreeing with intuition. This is getting us nowhere. The last one at least doesn't have intuition, but it's readily learned or understood. Same as simple, the last definition. Maybe that's going somewhere. Okay, so let's look up what intuition is. This is an excerpt, of course. It's the ability to know valid solutions to problems and decision making. It is using your base of experience as an expert to identify similar situations. So you have a base of experience. And intuition is pattern matching, matching quick, uh, feasible courses of action quickly. Well, this is one really big problem with this sense of intuition and simple that is that this applies to experts using their base of experience and pattern matching against things you've seen before, which is great if you are not a beginner. So how do you make things simple for beginners? Not by looking at the dictionary. Okay, so let's just try to figure out how to do C++ from nothing. As a simple C++ course, we start with first explaining that programs go from top to bottom. The computer doesn't wait for you, it just does everything top to bottom. And then we introduce things, integers, objects, variables. They have a lifetime. They start here, they end at the closing bracket. Then we add a function call. I can print some text. And then the program ends and everything is gone. Or I can call some other function. I can make a loop, so it repeats doing something until something else is true. I can make an if statement so I can have optional branches. I can go one way or another. And then we start creating functions. And at the time we're here, we basically have a, a basic start of a language. We can start programming. So let's see how this, how this goes. We start with a basic procedural flow. We have an empty program. It does nothing successfully because we have an implicit return of zero. So we don't have loops, function calls, or lifetimes, so we can't make an int, we can't return zero because we don't know any of that. And this seems completely useless, but there's actually a well-known program that all of you have probably used, which does nothing successfully, which is true on the command line. So if you run bin true, that does nothing successfully. So yay, first program done. Then we make things. They have lifetime, we create a window. And the window appears and disappears because, of course, the computer is not going to wait. So it starts the moment that the line is completed. It ends when the end of sc uh, scope is reached. So that's not all that useful. Let's add a function call. We add a sleep. Now we create a window. It sits there. And it goes away. So let's have a small demo. We create a window, it has a single pixel, and it sleeps. And this is all the code that we have. So you start at the bottom, you make a window, you make a canvas for drawing, you put a pixel there, and you show it. And then we sleep for four seconds. It's about as simple as you could make it. So let's go a little bit further, because this is still simple. What if we add more things? We've added the sleep, and now the, the window's sitting around, but the operating system says it's non-responsive. So why is that? Well, we are not listening to calls from the operating system because we are sleeping. We've told it to do absolutely nothing, so maybe we should not be sleeping. So what if we actively wait while the window should remain open? So while we should not close the window, show the window again. That works. We have a while loop. And let's do some more. We might be able to display some text. Have a function call, display hello world. And in this case, I'm sadly not going to be showing text because 
I'll get to that. But text is currently not yet implemented. <laughs> but we can take an image and then swap some things around. What we're doing is taking random positions and taking two pixels and swapping the values of them any number of times per frame. So over time, the image distorts. Which means that we've just learned about a while loop and we have graphical images, we have things to show, we have things that look really awesome. Even though it's just a static image being distorted, this is something we made. That's nice. We can also add if statements. If maybe we have an argument and then say hello person name. And if we don't have the argument, we just say hello world. Should be simple. We only have the C compatible main function. Which means that if we want somebody to say hello person, we're gonna have to explain we have two arguments, an int and a char with some stars in there that I don't want to explain to you. Because it's C and it's horrible and you don't want that. But we're still gonna sort of need this. Otherwise we can't have any command line input. It's not ideal. So let's try not doing that. Something else instead. But we can also create functions. If we're creating functions, we can initially start expanding main with all the other things we want to do. We have like a hundred line main and only the person that wrote it understands it. And at some point, you figure out that actually this is a separate thing. This is something I can name. Take it out, make it into a function, give it arguments, give it a return value. We can make new things. We can make the program more complicated. We can go into basically a demo. From the demo scene, we can go and draw things and then have a different function draw for five seconds, a different function for 10 seconds, and show visual animations, impress everybody. And we can also make more complicated demos. So this one is a very well-known one. Anybody not know what this is? This is the game of life from Conway. And it's based around a simple algorithm that's basically a convolution on what's already in there. So the program takes this as two buffers and runs a convolution from one to the other, displays it, runs it back, and displays it. And the code represents that. Because in this case, the code is, again, fairly simple. We have an initial state that we want. We make a function called init, which sets 11 pixels, with a reference why it's these 11 pixels. We have a function that does the Conway's game of life evolution step, as in go one frame beyond. And we have a main function, which runs Conway from B to A and then from A to B. This is still fairly understandable. So as a newbie to the language, you've gotten to the point that we can make reasonable programs, we can make fairly impressive things. So what did we not use? We've not used pointers. We've not used C. We haven't created classes for things. We haven't used inheritance. We don't need virtual. We don't need headers. We don't need any in inheritance model understanding. We don't need polymorphism. We didn't use a build system. We have no configurability. We have no libraries needed. We have no warnings options turned on, even though warnings are on. We have no licensing issues. We have a really simple system. Tony. That is uh, through a public domain library part of Pixel. Inside Pixel, so yes, that is with the library, but it is also uh, part of the software as, uh, as distributed. So how do you use the library? This is, okay, so I need to uh, narrow down. When I say without headers, I mean this is without using your own headers or your own software split up. You just have a simple implementation file and no header inclusion model yet. So when designing for simplicity, we want to be powerful enough. So we want to be able to show Conway's game of life. We want to be able to show somewhat more impressive things. But at the same time, we want to reduce the amount of knowledge you need to get there. We don't want you to learn about multiple graphics devices on your system, about many audio cases, how to interface with the Windows API, we don't want to have all the edge cases of maybe you have two screens. We, we don't even consider that. We omit all the language features. So while we could be using uh, very complicated things, we could be using variants, we could be using std any, could be using all sorts of complicated things, we choose not to. Because if I'm using 
variant, I must teach somebody what a template is. If I'm using vector, I have to teach them what a template is. And at this point, you don't need this yet. So for making simple things, as in for absolute beginners, maybe having something simple is better than being well designed. Just to show you one small line that uh, exemplifies that, is this line. On one hand, this could have been a class that says, I have a 2D sp uh, dimensional space. But if I did that, it would have been more complicated. I have an X and a Y. I now have a class that I need to explain. I have structure lifetimes. I have, maybe this won't be constructible from these arguments. Where do I get this point? How does it li its lifetime uh, work? Is it maybe a copy? Is it a reference to the original? And suddenly, this one line becomes more complicated but better designed. And in this case, we went for simple, and according to all design principles, less well designed. So we're going for simple. But in going for simple, we have to look at Arduinos and uh, Jewelbots. And they are basically event-driven. And event-driven is a way so that somebody else runs a main loop and you get callbacks whenever you need to do some updating. And this is simple in a way that hides a lot of magic, as in somebody else is doing the magic. It's not a complicated kind of magic, but it's something that somebody's not telling you. <coughs> and when you're learning C++, you want to know how does this work. So the alternative is, I go for fully procedural programs. I start at A, I go to Z. <coughs> There's nothing in between, no magic, nothing hidden. So in this case, I made the choice to go for procedural fully. So we're doing procedural, no events, no callbacks, no surprises, nobody going back where you didn't expect it. No audio where you might have multi-threading issues because you have problems then that are way beyond your level of understanding. So we're not going to do that unless we can make it simple <laughs> enough. And if we can make it simple enough, we can do audio. Let's do graphics first. We need ample examples. The best thing for a beginner is to start up some kind of editor and load an example, it shows something, it does whatever it does. And then you take the example, you modify it, you change it. So you start with something that works, and then you modify it. You're in your text editor, just typing away some words, you have no idea how the language works, you don't understand it, you're just going for some simple modification. We're changing the color from pink to blue. And then you compile and run it, because it's a single button. You know how that works, and it works. And now you get the experience that you modified something and it works. You are a computer programmer. The first day of a computer programmer, but still, you are the one changing something. So if we're going to the simple program, we change the color from pink to blue. We did that. One of the very first things you did is figure out I changed something. I am the one who was actively influencing what the computer does, not just by controlling a character on screen, but I was making it do something, just because I thought that it should do this. We have two more slightly, uh, slightly more complicated demos that don't use any more functionality than we used so far. Does anybody recognize this? Yes. This is? It is not background radiation. It is a recreation of a screensaver from the 90s somewhere, which takes a random field and then takes all the places where two colors of uh, adjacent colors are and replaces the lower color with the higher one, cyclically. So this basically has a giant array of random integers and applies a procedure to it. And this would be best done on a GPU because it's just doing a convolution on an image. But if I'm doing this on a GPU, I'm teaching you shader programming. So this is all done on the CPU because it's simpler. And in this case, you can change all the colors, you can change how it works, you can add more colors, see what, what changes. You can remove colors and see what happens. And eventually, it will start taking over the entire screen. So it's a simple program, but it's one that's at least somewhat directly appealing. 
As you can see, this one's wrapping around to the other side already. Let me check. We could also do some uh, different things because one of the easier demos to make in terms of how complicated the code is, is flying through space. It looks really awesome, but it's conceptually really easy. You just have some points and you move them as if they are stars in space and you're moving through it. So it needs a bit more thinking, but it's not all that complicated. I'm used to running faster. So this is just a program that has a few points. It does an iteration over them. It applies a simple algorithm. It goes through space. So one of the things that we are choosing to do is making the library small and open. I can read the code. I can understand it all. In case something breaks, I can look into it and see what happened. If I'm going a little bit beyond my first steps, I can take the library and proprietary take it as my own. I can take it and not worry about licensing. It should be public domain as far as possible. So you can take it and learn from it. You can modify it, you can improve it. And most of all, there are some things that are intentionally designed so that if you change it, it is technically just better. As in the points, if you know about structs and you know about those lifetimes, change those functions to use a point instead of two uh, uh, arguments. That's you changing code from somebody else. You're figuring out how to, everything interacts. Progressing. So you write it with simple C++. You try to make the library so that when somebody goes beyond the first layer, they know what they're seeing. They understand it. They recognize it. And everybody should have the ability to do this. You can take the library. You can modify it. You can ship your modified version. You can say, I made this, even though you only changed two lines. It's no problem. But there's a few rabbit holes. So, ready to go down, uh, down the rabbit hole? Yes. Okay, so what do, we do, what do we use? Do we base this on OpenGL? Do we base it on Vulkan or Metal or DirectX? Or maybe we should just make this for the Nintendo API so everybody can do it on their Switch. Or maybe we should use nothing and just do everything fully in software. Just make some really efficient software libraries. Um, yeah, that's a difficult choice. Uh, metal is probably a bad choice because then it would work on Macs and nothing else, so probably not Metal. DirectX would be nice, but it works on Windows and not on Linux or Macs, so bad idea. PlayStation, Xbox, and Nintendo, same argument, really. We need something that works on all systems. So that leaves basically software rendering, OpenGL, and Vulkan. Now suppose you're a new beginner and you're trying to learn how to make C++ in 2019. If we taught you software rendering, that would teach you a whole lot of skills and optimization techniques and parallelism that you would never be able to use because nobody does software rendering anymore, bar some corner cases. We could teach you Vulkan. Has anybody looked at Hope, Hello World in Vulkan? <laughs> yeah, so if you want to draw a single triangle on screen, the official recommended tutorial ver version of it is about 1,200 lines. Just <laughs> yes, but if somebody takes a library and wants to read it, they have 1,200 lines of code to get through, and swap chains and buffering and it's horribly complicated for them, which means that given that we want the library to be read by people, we are not going to be using Vulkan. So there's just one option. So we go for OpenGL. But which OpenGL? Do we go for IrisGL, the original one, the one that works on SGI workstations? Okay, maybe that, that's a bad idea. I don't think anybody has one. Maybe we go for OpenGL 1.x uh, or 2.0. And while this looks like another easy one to knock down, it actually isn't. Has anybody here used a, Mac, uh, a netbook? Yes, there's a few hands. Most of those still cannot do anything more than OpenGL 2.0. They're using Intel chips from a few years ago when Intel didn't do OpenGL 3 or 2.x. And those have been originally created 10 years ago, which means that they will do just immediate mode, not even using buffers. Okay, so let's assume that we're not using netbooks from 10 years ago because those have gotten out of fashion 
thankfully for that reason. Let's go for OpenGL2, which is using buffers. But then, if you actually want to use this in production anywhere, there's no actual company using OpenGL2 anymore. So we'd be teaching somebody some, some new things that are just beyond what they are going to be using. It's useless information. It's teaching the new legacy. Okay, so let's cross out 2.0. Maybe 3. Point something. Now we can use shaders. Well, yes, we could, but if we do this, it's slightly more complicated than 2.x. And there's a whole lot of uh, new improvements in OpenGL 4.5 plus that are using approaching zero driver overhead things, which means that they are much more efficient and many companies will start moving there. But if we use OpenGL 4.5, it's never gonna run on a Mac. They stopped at 4.1 and deprecated it. So 3.x is probably best. Okay, so how much OpenGL do we use? We use buffers, shaders, probably yes but maybe under the hood so that nobody sees it. Do we need to transform feedback? Do we even care about transform feedbacks? Do we need pipeline setups, texture setups, multi-GPU setups? It's probably useless for this, but maybe somebody wants that. Do we want samplers? Do we want to explain to somebody what the difference is between a sampler and a texture? No, that's not. But then on the other side of OpenGL, there's having a vertex definition. Maybe we want to render it to multi-targets. So we have two screens, so we can have 3D glasses. That would be cool, but it's a whole lot more complication. And we're not doing 3D. Or maybe we are. But then we have matrices that we need to explain. We have vertices. We have 3D transforms. We have, actually, you did draw everything correctly, but it's behind you. And all the problems coming with that. Maybe we want to teach procedural generation, so you can have a world automatically generated in front of you. So let's back up out of this uh, a bit. What do we want from graphics? What are we actually going to expose to the user? We want to have some surface to draw on, we want to change some pixels, and take it to a screen. Okay. Is that good enough? Or do we need something more? Okay, maybe we want to draw some text, because having Hello World is very practical to have. So we will be drawing some text, but not right now. Um, but if you're drawing text, you still can't really make a game. You'd be essentially telling the user, go do software editing yourself, because I'm not even doing it for you. So maybe we can offer just a little bit more power from OpenGL. Maybe we can load sprites. And then if you've loaded a sprite, you can move them around on the screen. So you have a small guy walking around and jumping and whatnot. And then save a drawing, because I made a drawing in a program and I save it to disk. I can save a screenshot. I can just take the same thing and save it. And this is probably enough. Do we need animation? Yes, I want to animate things, but I don't want to encumber you with animation. So if you want animation, you maybe want to do that yourself. So you just have multiple images and alternate. Do we want to scale things? Well, that's probably practical. Because if you want to do it yourself, that's going to be a whole lot of work. And for me, it's basically just giving them a float. Probably yes. Rotation, that would be nice if you can roll a wall. So yes, let's do that one as well. So if we're going to draw some text, and somebody may have seen this coming, how do we draw text? <coughs> so let's go down the rabbit hole. Let's assume that we just want to say, hello, person name, and whatever language you use, for like 95% of everybody. We can leave off some people, but let's not drop too many. So, hello world, this is an ASCII, or is it? Maybe I'm using one of the other encodings. But what if it's not, Dutch, uh, if it's not English, but Polish? I'm not trying to pronounce it. This might be ISO 8859-2, or even a different code page. What about this? First one says ni hao, so this is Chinese, but do we want any of those encodings? Or even worse? Okay, so this is a solved problem. This is not our problem anymore. We have Unicode. We can put every language that exists, including Kuniform, into Unicode. Kuniform is terrifying in Unicode, but 
Everything else is sort of same. But let's find out how same. Because there's multiple encodings. At least, we know that every operating system supports UTF-8. So every widely used operating system can do UTF-8. Yes, even Windows. But you have to enable it first. So it's a bit more work, but at least it's a choice that works for everybody. So how far do we go? We have Hello World. Start on the left, pick every letter, pick the glyph, put it on screen. Yes, we can do that. Polish. Well, we can start on the left, but there's this S. Or is it an S with an accent? Or is it a separate accent with an S? Thank you. Um, but is that one letter, or is it two things? Well, it's both. Because there's a normalization, which is composed or decomposed. And if it's composed, then it's one letter. If it's decomposed, it's two. So I don't know what the user's gonna give me. So we could be doing Unicode normalization, but okay, kind of worms, but maybe not. We could also just draw the S, and then if somebody wants to give us an accent, we draw the accent and then not move the cursor. And then we draw an accent first and then an S beneath it, and it, that looks fine. It's good enough. So just draw the accent. And just put the, the composed character in as well, so we have the character twice, maybe, sort of, but that's okay. Um, so, ni hao. This is really hard. But I'm thinking about writing this. In this case, we're not writing, we're drawing. We just have a glyph. And we put the glyph on the screen, we put the next glyph, we have a comma, and so on. This is easy. So what about this? Does anybody know how to read this? Yeah. Yes, this text is backwards. Um, okay. So for the simple character drawing, how, how do we make that fit? So we need to start on the right, and then draw left of that, and then decrement our cursor position and not... So what if we just do it backwards? So if it's one of those characters, we draw left. Well, negative X offset. This is gonna work. Shalom Phil. Well, crap. Now we're gonna draw it on top of each other. Okay, so we have to bite the bullet here. Either we're gonna lose out on all of Arabic and all of Israel and all the right to left languages, unless we sort of handle this. So, yeah, we're not doing this. So we are gonna be using a Unicode sublibrary derived from the stood text proposal to handle this correctly. So then you do get bidirectional correctly. Okay, so what if you go beyond the more crazy languages? So like this. Does anybody here read Arabic? Okay, maybe I can make this simpler because this looks like a really complicated drawing and I think there's more letters in there. Maybe I would just add a space between all the letters so we can read them separately and then just draw that all together and hope that it's fine. Um, no, this is not gonna work. This doesn't even look like the same letters. That E-like letter in the middle, I don't, that's not gonna work. So to do Arabic, we basically have to do all the ligatures. We have to combine everything and use different symbols depending on what they're next to, have a complete mapping in memory, do all the Unicode stuff. Nope, I can't do that, that's too much support. That's basically dragging in all of libICU and everything attached to it. So it's not gonna be Arabic. So what about this one? Hello Zelgo. <laughs> this is an internet thing where people add way too many accents and combining characters onto a single letter and then just sort of give it to the Unicode engine and say, good luck with that. Um, it looks funny, but it's a lot of work to get to work right, especially if you look at the two L's, they are spaced further apart, so there's space for bigger accents. So this is really complicated. That's not gonna work. So, oh wait, we can do that as well in Unicode. <laughs> but this one we can do. So what about the actual shruggy emote? Do we want to add emoji? Well, simple emoji. I guess so, that's no big deal. I just have to put them in a character set. But the things you can do in Unicode with emoji is combine them into bigger emoji. So you can have a family with skin colors indicated and professions indicated and combine all of them into single character with like 150 byte encoding. Yeah, no, no, we're not going there. So these three, 
while they are nice to support, we're not going to because it's just, there's no point. Nobody's going to say hello to that person and then expect that to work. It's not the name of a person. It's just messing around. So let's stop messing around. So what about keyboard and mouse input? Well, we don't need it. And it's much harder to test your own software because now there's non-deterministic input. Somebody's pushing a button and we're not counting on it. But what is a computer game if you don't have inputs? It's like Game of Life, which I looked at and was like, this is not a game. And I really want to have feedback loops where you're looking at the screen and you're controlling something and it's, it's which is just a whole lot of fun. <coughs> so what about music and sound? I want to do music and sound. I love to have music and sound. But if it gets callbacks, then my code is going to be multi-threaded. It's going to be accidentally messing things up. We're going to do volatile because nobody read the memo that we shouldn't do volatile. OK, so can we do simple music? So we just take a file, load it in memory, and say, play this right now in the buffer. And give it a handle to say, just complete. So I can poll. So no events, no, no awkward, uh, awkward things happening. It's fine. So this is probably fine. So I'm going to skip the first one. And I'm not sure if this is one is going to run fine. But we can make a simple platformer. Which is, again, just using simple primitives. We're loading uh, things from a file, and we are rendering them on screen. We're still not doing anything complicated. This is still a demo that's 60 lines of code. Any new beginner that has like a day of work, he can read this, he can understand this, and he can make things happen. Like, for example, if I'm pushing up all the time, I don't rocket into space. Or maybe you do because you want to have a double jump. Maybe you don't. Maybe you want to have a power up before you get the double jump. You can do so many nice things if you have a basis to start from. So the conclusion, um, for the teachers, the people that teach C++, C++ is not a bad language. It is a good language that you can start with. You need to just make some work to make it accessible. And you do that by not teaching C. So for the students, C++ is a language that you can use as a first language. You can start here. You need to watch out for all the legacy stuff, for all the uh, complexity you might get drawn into. You need to watch out for people giving you code that used to work 10 years ago and that's actually 20 years out of date. And you need to start learning C because C is not going to help you at all. So for, if you're a committee member, I'm not sure if we have many committee members, but maybe online. C++ is a living language, it's not dead. It is actually gonna be living for a long time. New people want to learn this, they like it. And many developers started after C++11 came out which means that we need to have work from the committee to make it more accessible. So stop C++ being C. We don't want the old stuff anymore. We don't want the C++ 98 hacks anymore. Just make it a good language. And then final one for developers. C++ has moved on. We are not doing C++ 98 anymore, not even 89. We don't have an IO stream.h. We have all new things. And the new things actually really are better. Make sure that you help new people in the language. They, you give them a hand up and always realize how well uh, they have adjusted to the language yet, how much they know. Because if you don't, you're going to give them a whole lot of mental load understanding what you're trying to explain in them trying to understand what they're doing. So that was me. And for CPP on C, I made one final demo, which is basically the start field, except with a different graphic. The code is almost identical. So, thank you very much. Let's see, we have 15 minutes for questions. Any questions? I have not yet used the library in teaching yet. I oh. really want it to be picked up, and I want to make it one of the standard curricula. But I'm reaching out basically with this talk to make sure that people know that it exists, that more teachers learn about it, and that we can start using it, or at least together figure out some other way to make it happen. Uh, two questions. Just the sampling of this library reminded me of something that I saw on YouTube that's very similar. It's called the 2D pixel engine. 
Plus yes. Okay, I will remember to check that one. It's 2D pixel. 2D pixel. Yes, thank you. Uh, yes. Uh, Juan Pe. Uh, I didn't understand the argument for not supporting Arabic in this situation. Well, the difficulty with Arabic is that if you're trying to support it, let's see, that's this one, uh, we need to have combining ligatures. And combining yeah. ligatures requires a whole lot more data. Uh, that's but, I don't know, it feels like it's a way of this one. Yes. Can we just use the library? Maybe. <coughs> the question is, this is a really complicated transformation and it requires cooperation not just from a Unicode library but also from font rendering side. Mm -hmm. Which means that this is significantly more work than all the languages before. Which means that we probably do want to support this. But if we do, then it's going to be a whole lot more work which means a whole lot more stuff to read for anybody reading the code. So how do you balance those two? On one hand, you have people that might not be able to use it if it doesn't do Arabic. On the other hand, you have a whole lot of people that wouldn't be able to learn from it if it does. It depends on the library you use, right? Like what they yes. So if you use some kind of uh, free type library to draw and a Unicode library to understand it, it's probably OK. Yes, so that is a good point. Thank you. The person behind? Uh, I have not heard of G VGFX ever. It's like a small library. It's not really a protection because I don't necessarily like it. Like, I <laughs> yeah, you have to kind of place a, a capture that you might have seen on RTX or that in mind. You can kind of maybe have one kind of feature you have of Miguel. You don't have Miguel yet on Android, usually do iOS as well. So you can kind of like have an abstraction of those two assets. That is a good point. So you could be using, what was the name again? VGFX. VGFX as a backend for this so that you can switch the backend behind it. But then you're learning VGFX as a library, which I admit that I haven't heard of before. While you could be teaching them OpenGL or Vulkan, which many people have heard of and will need to be able to use on their job applications. So on one hand, I want them to know that they're doing OpenGL so you can put it on your list of knowledge as in I've done OpenGL. Yes, Tristan? So I'm curious as to the, sort of the motivation to why you want the user to learn is to be able to go into the library code and understand the library code. Because I'm thinking, you know, something like standard vector, you'd never tell whether it's a beginner to go and look at the implementation of standard vector because it does horrible complicated things with allocators and they're nowhere to go with that. Yes. But you still want them to use vector. Right? So the question is why do I want people to look into the library and understand it as opposed to using it? Yes. Whatever is DirectX back end and you use that for the so you give you a lot more freedom in implementation. That is a really good point. In this case, the argument is do you want to make a graphics library or do you want to make a graphics library that is intentionally made essentially hamstrung by being so simple that anybody can understand it and use it? And given the amount of offers for the first one, I am making a library for the second category. So if you do want to have all the options and uh, all the abilities you should use SDL or SFML or GLFW. They do this, they have all the implementation. If you want to have a restricted subset of that es essentially made for students to start learning, then this library is much more, much more applicable. Well, I was thinking something that still has a very simple kind of front end for users as, as this has, but you know, maybe it does complicate stuff in the background, but you don't have to worry about that. You can just focus on your basic you know, making Mario's more quick and easy. Well, that is a fairly good argument. Um, in this case, I actually want people to pierce through the library to understand that not everything in the world is magic and understand that you can go in there and read it. It might be complicated. It might not be as complicated as you expect. But it's something you can always go one level deeper. You can learn more. You can read things. And you can discover what they have been building on. So in this case, it's almost intentionally giving them a hook that says, this is a library. It has a few files. It's not really complicated. It's completely yours to modify and ship. In, you're intended to go through and find SDL and OpenGL. And when you found SDL, you're like, how did SDL make this? And now you've got an impetus that says, I've understood this. Maybe I should just go one level further into SDL and understand how they do things, if you're interested. If you're not interested, just use it. Uh, Arvid?
C toy? I haven't. You know, it's basically C C C and you get a window and you can do live coding. It's 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 literally the same same words you have. You get a C file, you, you run it with, with a little program and it's it, it has a window open, you get to the C file, you save it and it's the GPL type that you want to try and it changes for the window. Basically it gives you a little graphics program and it's it's you do download it from GPL, but literally you just run it through the window, you run it to the C file in there. So Arvid recommends a tool called Ctoy. Let me just uh, type it out. It's super simple. I mean, if you if you're interested in Google and GitHub, there's actually a demo with the Ctoy in there. This is uh, spelled correctly, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, which um, is apparently for the same goal. Uh, does it support C++? I think it's C. I think it's probably technically right C++. No, it's C because it's using CCC. Yes. Oh. Given that it's using the tiny C compiler, the one intended to just do C, it is not going to support C++ in any time soon, I'm expecting. Yes. So it's, it's, it's super I completely super appreciate it, but it's slightly different. Uh, one thing that is also different is that I am trying to get you into the idea of compiling code. So you are still using a build system. You're still pushing a button to do things, which is identical to the thing you're doing in a company in a big, complicated environment. It's just a simplified version of the same thing. And this would teach you that you can use this for writing code, but if you write C code outside of it, you'd still be left without an idea what to do. Right, yeah, it's more like give people the free simple graphics code. Yes. So the uh, function would be similar to Shader Toy, for example, which is an online website where you can write GLSL programs and make nice shaders. But yeah, doing that doesn't get you into shader programming for any kind of game. Yes. Thank you for the comment. I was thinking, yeah, like, to, to use this, you still need to know, for example, about your kind of terminal. You need to get a text editor. Uh, you need to yes. know how to navigate to the sites and type the compile commands, uh, which is not a lot, of course, for us, but maybe for someone that's the first time that wants to program a little bit more. So how do you see that? Uh, maybe um, uh, entertain the idea of uh, the layering this to WebAssembly or something, where you could, like, visit a website and, like, get a text editor Like yes. Uh, well, yes, again, the same point applies. I am trying to get you into the normal habit of what developing software is like, mm -hmm. but I would prefer this to have an IDE in front of it. Mm -hmm. I did the talk uh, using VI and uh, a command line because that's something I'm very used to and I'm nervous enough as is. Mm -hmm. uh, if I had been less nervous, I would probably start with VS Code, which would have done the exact same thing, push a button to start evoke, it builds everything, except that I wouldn't have had a terminal. I wouldn't have had the same complications that I have now. So I, I will try to do that next time I give the talk. The, the second part of the question was because then my train of thought led me to, okay, well, if you're going to do it in a web, in the browser anyway, why you use C++, you can use JavaScript uh, and a canvas. Um, but I understand that you want to like show C++, like it's also about teaching C++ language, right? Yes. So, um, the major part of this is actually making sure that people that say, I would like to learn C++ and get told by a hundred people that this is a terrible idea, go learn JavaScript and TypeScript and yeah. whatever, so that they have something to use that does teach them C++. The, the, the idea then was like, do this, for example, the API be modeled after the Canvas API from HTML, which is also, for example, in QML and other places, to have some knowledge that then can be transported between languages. Yes. So the intent is that actually the uh, area you draw on is called a canvas mm -hmm. with the intent of matching HTML. You have a color class that has exactly the list from W3C for all the color names. So they are exactly the same and they completely match up. That is all intentional so that any knowledge you may have gained from somewhere else still applies here. And if you learn about a canvas and drawing things on it, you can take that knowledge into JavaScript and it's still a canvas, it's still a color. Mm -hmm. And it's still without a U because for some reason the world wants that. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you.